justice, no peace. I'm Donnie. I'm Kalia. I'm Alana. And I'm Janelle. And welcome to DMLK's The Take. In this series, we'll address the inequities in education today. We will release a new episode every other Thursday. Throughout this series, we will be discussing how we will keep our resolution alive by having conversations with some key people in the implementation, sustainability, and overall success of our resolution. In last week's episode, we talked with the authors of Black History 365, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Milton. What stood out to me was their purpose, which was to create cutting edge resources that invite students, educators, and other readers to become critical thinkers, compassionate leaders, fact-based, respectful communicators, and action-oriented solutionists. I think that it is really important that we are able to adopt their book in the DPS curriculum. I learned more about the BH365 textbook and how to implement into our schools. I also learned the benefits of having this textbook as our district's curriculum. It gave me a lot more insight on how much work went into the Black History 365 book as well how important it is that we include it in the changes being made here in DPS with our resolution. For me, it was enlightening. Being able to see and discuss such a beautifully illustrated representation of us in a book really warmed my heart. And I can't wait for other kids to have that experience too. So I'm sure you are wondering what's up this week. This is our take. Same purpose, different leader. With all the work we put into our resolution, you already know we're not stopping anytime soon. Regardless of what changes happen within the district, specifically with the new superintendent coming in, we may have a new leader, but the purpose of our movement to have equity within our education will remain just as important and just as valued. In today's episode, we'll be speaking to Susana Cordova, former superintendent of Denver Public Schools. Welcome and thank you for joining us on The Take today. Before we get started, we have to remind our listeners about our trigger alert. Janelle, can you please read the trigger alert? If you're not 110% in support of Black Lives Matter, please dismiss yourself. If you are in any sort of agreement with the systemic oppressions this country has inflicted on minorities, once again, please dismiss yourself. And if you're not willing to give every bit of the power that the people so undeniably deserve, then please dismiss yourself. Because in a few moments, you will witness vast amounts of Black engagement, and if you do not dismiss yourself, then the thoughts, facts, and feelings we are about to share will most definitely dismiss you. Okay, Superintendent Cordova, you are one of the first Latina superintendents and only one of two women of color to lead Denver Public Schools. That's impressive. What else would you like our listeners to know about you? Uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think probably what I'd like people to know is um, you know, I was a DPS student. I um, went to Barnum and then to Kepner and graduated from Abraham Lincoln and started teaching in DPS um, all the way back in 1989, decades before you were born um, and have really just loved my time in DPS. Well, thank you so much for your willingness to join us today. As you know, the focus of the series is on the No Justice, No Peace resolution, which all began with the trip that we took to the African-American History Museum and Culture in Washington, D.C. last year. And yes. Oh, sorry. Uh-huh. Um, I just wanted to say that before we begin this discussion, I feel like it's important that we just acknowledge how difficult it must have been for you trying to reopen schools during a pandemic with everything going on with all of our racial injustices that were occurring across the country. And I just know that I personally couldn't really handle the stress of being in that position. So I just hope you know that we acknowledge how difficult that must have been leading up to everything that's going on. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think for all of us, this is like, you know, probably a once in a lifetime experience. Like you someday are gonna be, you know, my age or older looking back on this time and let's cross our fingers. Um, it doesn't happen again, but um, you know, I'm, I'm 54, I've never experienced anything like this and I don't think any of us really have. And so um, it was a lot of new things and first time things and, you know, scary headlines, um, but I'm really proud of how the whole DPS community has rallied around. That's true, it's all been kind of crazy, but I feel like um, it's gonna be coming to an end soon. But um, just to get a start with some just basic information and questions. According to the School Superintendents Association 2020 Decennial Study, 
Although nearly 90% of school superintendents said conversations about race and equity are either extremely or very important, only 21% said they were very well prepared for that responsibility. Where would you say you are on this scale? Yeah, so thank you. Um, you know, I think particularly as a woman of color, um, the my experiences in the world are very influenced by being uh, a Latina. And um, to this day, when I walk into a room, the first thing I do is I look around to see like, who are the other people of color in a room? And um, far too many times, uh, particularly when I walk into rooms with superintendents or with decision makers, with leaders in the community, I can usually count on one hand the number of leaders of color um, in the room. And um, that definitely has influenced who I am as a leader. Um, and I think for all of us, for BIPOC people, um, we learn at an early age, both what it feels like to experience racial discrimination, um, and then at some point what it takes to be able to stand up and to speak up. Um, and so I feel really fortunate, um, particularly in the Denver Public Schools where I've worked for so long, that we've had conversations about equity, about diversity, um, about inclusion, uh, for a long time. Um, and um, while I don't consider myself an expert, I do believe deeply in the need uh, to create spaces where conversations can happen um, about racial justice. It's why I became a teacher um, and I'm committed to being a learner on the journey to create more equity for our students. Um, and so I felt more prepared to step into that space because of the urgency um, but I definitely know how important it is to create um, the learning opportunities for the people who don't feel ready. So I like that point you made where you said you look around to see other people in the room that are also BIPOC or students of color. And I feel like that's important because I realize that a lot of students who are of different races always look around to see who's like them in the classroom or wherever they go, they look around and see who's like them. If, they are comfortable in that place or if they could react in a certain way. But um, that also goes into how you create spaces in the classroom where you could teach um, BIPOC students and stuff like that. So that brings me to the resolution. And can you tell us your impressions on the No Justice, No Peace resolution? And like, what were your initial thoughts hearing it for the first time? Um, I am so inspired by just how clear you all are um, in your focus on the importance of this issue. It's something that I'm deeply passionate about myself. Um, and it's something that I, I know was part of the reason why I decided to become a teacher. Um, and I'm, I'm super glad we're at the point where this has been um, passed by the board, is part of who we are and um, will help guide the work moving forward. And the reason why I think that's so important is um, when I was in the classroom as a teacher, I always tried to make sure that I was using materials that reflected the diversity of my students. When I moved to the curriculum office, um, I worked really hard on that same thing. And um, I did that because I didn't have that experience as a student, I know how important it is. Um, and it's kind of heartbreaking to me that despite my own personal hard work, despite the efforts of lots of people, there are still far too many students in the Denver Public Schools today who don't get the experience of seeing themselves. Um, and it's a lot more than buying the books. Um, like we can buy books and if teachers don't use them, kids don't see them. Um, and if it's in an anthology and people skip that story, you don't get the chance to learn it. Um, and it's really important that this not be, um, you know, the, the phrase that I used coming in as a superintendent is things have to happen not by accident, but by design. I mean, how fortunate are you that you all got to go to visit the African American History Museum in Washington, DC? But in some ways there are so many kids just like you who haven't had that experience. It can't be the lucky accident that you go to DMLK, that you have a principal who was able to put together this trip, that you got this exposure. It has to be the design for all kids. Um, and that really is what the resolution represents to me is how do we design a system so that all students, BIPOC and our white students get to experience the richness of the full history, the full literature, the full experiences of the United States. 
I just wanted to say thank you for your kind words about our resolution. It really means a lot to us. And that's a really good question that I don't really think any of us can answer right now, but it does bring me to our next question for you. Why do you think that it's important to carry on this work? Yeah, um, so um, I'm, um, I'm gonna tell two quick little stories. Um, you know, I, um, I, it wasn't until I was in college that I ever read a piece of literature that expressed the positive aspects of the Latinx community. Um, and I, you know, mostly what I heard in school were kind of like the negative messages about my community um, and the stereotypes uh, about poor people and gang members and um, uneducated people, um, you know, things like that. It wasn't until I got to college that I was able to read something and it completely changed my view of what it meant um, to um, be proud of my own culture. I spent a lot of time in high school. I would have the kind of kid that they would have called whitewashed when I was in high school. Um, that's really painful. It's really painful to feel like the only way you can be smart is if you don't embrace your own culture. Um, and I became a teacher because I didn't want kids to experience that. Um, and I remember um, fast forward many years later, I've done all this work, I'm sitting in a room uh, with a group of students um, at Manuel High School. And they're telling me the exact same story that um, you know, the only time they heard about their culture was um, talking about slavery or Martin Luther King, um, and that's it. Um, and we have got to do better than that. And um, I think it's important for kids because you can't really um, fully realize your potential if you believe there's a part of yourself that isn't worthy. And if the only thing you hear are the negative images and stereotypes that society pushes, um, if you don't get the opportunity to learn about the rich contributions, you can't ever really fully see yourself in all of your glory, in your culture's wisdom, in the gifts. Um, and it's hard to then want to be engaged in learning. And I think we see kids do two things when they don't see their culture in their curriculum. Um, either they reject their culture and they dig in, um, but they deny a part of themselves or they reject school because school is saying to fit in, to be smart, you have to give up your culture. And if you're not willing to do that, we see kids reject um, school. Um, and I don't think it should be either or, um, and we owe it to our kids to let them see themselves um, and their history um, and the contributions of um, their ancestors and the intersectionality um, that all of the cultures in the United States bring um, in ways that celebrate um, the diversity of who we are. Um, I think what you just said is really important and like kind of hits the nail on like, for example, of students either rejecting their culture or rejecting school. I think what we're doing with the resolution will definitely combat that, but also really quickly, because I want to say something before I forget your question about how we can spread the resolution with throughout the US, I believe. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're actually working with the Justice Center, with the Justice Policy Center, Justice Policy Center in Washington, DC. And we're, we've been collaborating with them for a little bit of time now, just working on, you know, doing research about how, you know, how we can push our resolution out there and what we're doing as student activists. So I feel like our work with them will definitely lead to a wider national outreach with our resolution. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to Dallas, so maybe I'll see if I can take it with me to Dallas. That'll be fun. That would be really, really amazing. That'd be and good. <laughs> I wanted to ask, before the resolution was um, proposed, what areas within DPS had opportunities for growth? And do you believe that the current plans within the resolution will force these areas to improve? Yeah, so thank you. Um, you know, I think we've done a lot of work to try to get our curriculum to be more reflective. Um, and um, so there were some places um, where we had done some really important work, um, but there were still gaps. You know, one of the things that's really challenging is uh, particularly in a state where school funding is so low, um, our funding in Colorado is um, definitely in the bottom half. Um, we've gone up a little bit, 
um, but we're probably in the bottom 20 um, in how we fund our schools um, nationwide um, in one of the richest states um, in the United States. Um, and so that means things like our social studies curriculum at elementary is 15 years old. So think about um, who in here is 15? Anybody in here 15? That means we have materials that are older than you are in our classrooms. And like, that's an entire lifetime. And so much has happened in 15 years. Like, I'm trying to think back to 15 years ago. Like, I don't even think I was carrying a cell phone around with me every day in 15 years. Like the speed with which things have changed um, is just astronomical. Um, and our kids are not able to then um, have resources that really reflect the changes that have happened in the world. And it's really important that we do that. So I, I definitely think that's one of the places where we have a lot of opportunity. Um, but then again, I, I really just wanna hit on this idea, like we can buy all of the books in the world, but if teachers don't teach them, if they don't use them in ways that create safe spaces for learning, if they minimize the, the contributions, if they gloss over the aspects of it, it's not gonna have the impact that we need it to. So in addition to revising curriculum, in addition to new materials, in addition to more diverse um, representations in our resources, we need our teachers to be trained on how to use them and how to create the space for students to learn. So I have another question then. How mm -hmm. do we teach teachers to be more culturally responsive in their classrooms? Yeah, so thank you. You know, one of the things I'm really proud of is from the very first day that teachers come into the Denver Public Schools when they're very first hired, we really try to just immerse them in a culture that is one of equity. Um, and so from the very earliest experiences that new teachers have in DPS, we're talking about the importance of representation, the importance of language, the importance of um, language um, diversity, the importance of culture, um, moving beyond, um, they talk about food and fiestas, like moving beyond um, things like that um, to the deeper aspects of culture. Um, and then really creating a space where diversity of thought can also take place. Um, and it is really important and it's also really challenging um, in the Denver Public Schools the demographics of our teachers and the demographics of our students are almost the exact mirror opposite. So we're a district where about 75% of our students are BIPOC and where about 75% of our teachers are white. And so it does mean that everyone, all of our educators, our teachers and our school leaders need to commit to learning about equity, to learning about culturally sustaining practices um, and to do that, um, understanding that um, we have to be able to recognize our own biases, we all have them, um, so that kids will be um, able to, um, you know, be in a classroom that truly does uh, recognize them for what they bring as assets. Um, I just think this conversation we had so far is really important because I know off the bat, our resolution, like we worked on it, so we know like all the details and the importance of it, but off the bat, I know a lot of people might just think this is just about adding BIPOC history, but so much more. And I feel like this conversation has definitely gave, like maybe those people who don't understand a lot more clarification, but I also kind of want to shift gears a little bit towards mm -hmm. some, like, I guess some questions regarding your position as mm -hmm. our former superintendent. And just firstly, I'd like to start off by asking, on November 13th, you announced your resignation as superintendent of Denver Public Schools. And most recently, it was announced our interim superintendent will be Mr. Dwight Jones. What steps have you taken to ensure our resolution remains a priority for him and the new superintendent? Yeah, so thank you. A great question. Um, and it is really true, like one person doesn't do this work alone. We really do need everybody bought in. Um, so Tamara Acevedo, who's the Deputy Superintendent of Academics, who's worked really closely with um, your team and your school um, and her teams, um, is deeply, deeply committed to this work. It's her team uh, that's kind of doing the day-to-day -day work on making sure that curriculum revisions, teacher training reflects the expectations um, in the resolution. Uh, Dwight Jones is all in on continuing 
our work um, around our crisis priorities and supporting the board's vision, both the vision of, of black excellence, as well as the no justice, no peace um, resolution, that I think really expands the notion um, that's in the black excellence um, resolution uh, to truly be reflective of the diversity of our entire um, school community. Um, and so I think uh, one of the things I have personally been really impressed with is how um, your experience on your visit didn't just stay centralized on that visit or the experience of Black and African American um, uh, students, but that really is expanded um, and that you have the support, um, for example, of the Latinx students in your school uh, to think about what are the implications for all of us? Um, and I've really appreciated that. That's something that Dwight um, is very, very committed to. And so I think we'll continue to see the kind um, of teacher training, the kind of curriculum revisions. Um, we've hired outside experts to help do um, some reviews of our materials uh, to make sure that we are on the right path. Uh, people who have um, deep expertise in critical race theory. Um, we've renamed our curriculum team. So it is the culturally sustaining curriculum instruction team to get at that concept of, of what the experience is like when students are able to be culturally sustained um, in this work. I know that you mentioned that 75% of the teachers um, are in DPS are white and 75% of the students are of BIPOC. And you also said that he is all in for the work that we are doing, but knowing both of these things, what are your wishes for the incoming superintendent as it relates to the specifically to the resolution? Yeah, so um, I think it's really important for both Dwight and then the permanent superintendent to first and foremost, um, read the resolution, understand what's in it, um, understand uh, what efforts are underway. Um, and then like the real benefit of having new people is, um, you know, sometimes when you're in the middle of the work, it's, you know, that's like that old saying, like you can't see the forest for the trees. A lot of times when you're in the middle of the work, you see what you wanna see because you know what you wanna have happen. Um, but new people can come in and they can sort of look around and actually see what is or isn't happening. Um, and so my hope for um, both Dwight and for the permanent superintendent when she or he is selected is that they're able to honestly assess what's happening, build on the strongest practices um, that we see, but then really um, take those next steps um, into the opportunity areas, the places where maybe we haven't gone as deep um, it's a lot easier, as I said, to as hard as it as hard as it is to rewrite curriculum. It's easier to do that than to make sure that teachers use it effectively. Um, and so that ongoing transformational work in teacher training, in the experiences in classroom, getting feedback from students. I think those feedback loops are really, really important. I, I think that was a really good. Um, way to make sure that we've got that um, ongoing student input. Um, is really important. I definitely, definitely agree with the ongoing student input. And um, I remember one time when Tamara was here and we were talking to her and Theo about um, the, the new curriculum that they're writing. They talked about those feedback loops. And I definitely do feel like having students be able to put input into it will be able to bring more justice to education. and. We believe that justice is executing thorough, detail-oriented and strategic actions that encompass real change so that every individual student can receive equity within their education and in their lives. Um, how do you feel you did the, the resolution justice while you were superintendent? Yeah, so thank you. Um, you know, I, I feel like I've been really fortunate to have um, both the support of our board um, and the teams working hard, even while we're in the middle of like, you know, this crazy pandemic um, to do the important work of um, both the teacher training and then the curriculum reviews. And um, I can give you one example of something that I'm super proud of um, around teacher training. We had a, uh, we call them teal days. It's a day for teacher training that was happening um, in October. And it was sort of right at the time when elementary schools were going back, um, uh, middle schools and high schools weren't open yet. 
Um, but there was a lot of anxiety around COVID. And then we have this day plopped in in the middle. That's a teacher training day. Um, and I got some texts um, from a couple of different teachers. You know, I've worked in the district for a long time. So a lot of my friends are teachers in DPS. So I had a couple people text me and say, hey, I just went to this training and they're talking about decolonializing the curriculum. Um, and it's the first time I've ever heard anybody in DPS talk in that way about what it means to create curriculum that doesn't just represent one perspective, the kind of perspective that you usually see in a history book. And that's the kind of action that I'm really proud of, that we took the language of a resolution, we took the belief in what it means to be culturally sustaining, we actually have conversations about what are the characteristics of white supremacy culture, and what are the antidotes to white supremacy culture, and we build it into the work that we're doing. Um, and so I'm really proud of that teacher training. I have a teacher advisory council and every meeting that we have every month, we talk about what are the examples of white supremacy culture that they see in their schools and what are the antidotes, what we can do to help change the experience for all educators. Um, and one of the things that I think is really great about being a BIPOC person myself is that it's much more common that we think about communal approaches to work um, in BIPOC communities. And it just, I believe, makes for an, a more inclusive environment for everyone, for our students and for our teachers. Um, I actually think that's really interesting, the part where you said, um, where you had some friends who were teachers or you have some friends who are teachers here in DPS. And when they heard the term de um, decolonizing um, our history, I feel like it's really important to acknowledge that not only by bringing in a new curriculum and a new way we're teaching our students, we're also teaching our teachers because as far as we know, like when you propose something new, we're kind of all getting used to it. So I feel like it's important that not only we introduce this to our teachers that they get a better understanding of it, but by the time it gets to our students, our teachers aren't just reading something off a book or a page and just like teaching it, like just spitting it out. I feel like it's equally important that we actually have our teachers understand it as well. And just to speak on that, it's to my understanding that DPS has an ongoing curriculum adoption cycle. And we also know that it's been 12 years since the last elementary history curriculum adoption. So could you please elaborate on that process of the adoption cycle? Sure, yeah. Um, so whenever we do a curriculum adoption, um, and particularly at the elementary level where um, we have lots of our students who are learning to read both in English and in Spanish, we look at materials um, that align to our state standards. Um, that's the law. And so it's really important that we do that. We also look at um, materials that are available both in English and in Spanish, uh, because we wanna make sure that we're including all of our learners um, in the um, resources um, as we do that. And then we do use a rubric um, that helps us look at how well the curriculum addresses diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the teams that do this typically um, have teachers, have school leaders, have folks from the curriculum teams. Um, one of the things that I think we should do, and this uh, resolution has really helped us think this through in a different way. Um, I don't think we've actually leveraged student voice very effectively, student reviewers um, in the process. And so I think it'd be really important as we look forward, uh, particularly because of the resolution to think about what role can students play. Um, and high school students will probably be in a better position to help us with the curriculum adoption, even if it's for elementary resources than our elementary kids, because you have been able, particularly the folks who have been so deeply involved in this initiative, you've been able to um, learn a lot about what, what, what you're hoping to see um, in the different resources. Uh, thank you. I feel like that um, covered what, I guess the entire adoption cycle is yeah. really well. So um, thank you for that. Yeah. But I guess one last question I have for you would be that since Denver is your home, I could imagine that leaving it is probably bittersweet. And moving to da Dallas Independent Schools, how do you plan on upholding the value of equity to your new position as Deputy Superintendent of Leading and Learning? Yeah, so thank you. Um, in my new job in Dallas, um, I'll actually be a little bit closer, um, kind of like the job Tamara has. Um, so overseeing our schools team, the academic support teams um, and their strategy office. Um, and so I'm really excited to be able to kind of dig back in. I did a lot of curriculum work. Um, I was the head of 
the academic office for about um, eight years in DPS. And so I'm really looking forward to getting closer into that work. Um, and I can honestly say like the work in Denver has completely influenced who I am and what I believe is important for kids. Um, and so I'm only um, joking a little bit about bringing the resolution with me. Um, I think it's gonna be really important to first learn what they're doing. Um, I, I think anytime you go into a new place, you're not an expert um, of the new place. You might be an expert of your own place, but you're a new person in the new place. That's so gonna be important for me to learn the work that they're doing um, and then look for ways that we can make sure that we're creating the kind of opportunities for kids that are so powerful that are really captured in the no justice, no peace resolution. Um, and so I think that um, it'll be a fun time for me to both learn, uh, but then to bring some of the learnings um, that, that um, I've been able to um, gain from my experiences here in Denver. I think that is great. And I really just wanna wish you luck on go, well, not luck, cause you don't need it, but I really wanna I wish do. you well. <laughs> I really want to wish you well when you go to Dallas and your position. Yeah. I also want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking to us. It means a lot. Uh, thank you. So I have to tell you all, you know, I um, didn't go away to college. I'm from Denver and I went to the University of Denver. Um, I got a scholarship to go to school. And so I keep telling myself, I'm going to approach this like an 18 year old getting ready to go off to college. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous and I'm a little bit scared, um, but I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to le learn a new place. And what I would encourage all of you to do is to make sure you set your sights really high as you go through that college application process. Don't be like me and think that the only thing you can do is close to home because the reality is you can go anywhere and the experience that you've had um, with no justice, no peace has taken you back and forth across the country, back and forth across time, and will take you so deeply into your own future in ways that you just can't even imagine today. Um, and the skills that you are gaining from this process are gonna serve you well wherever you go, but set your sights super high um, because I have no doubt that you will achieve great things. Thank you so much and I'm um, sorry, but thank you. And I really, I do wish you luck and I thank hope that you're safe on your trip to Dallas. Thank you so much. Congratulations, everyone. On today's episode, we talked about how important it is that students continue to see themselves within the work that they are learning. We also discussed a study around superintendents and their preparedness to talk about racism and ethnicity, even in the midst of a pandemic. Within all of this, we highlighted Ms. Cordova's hopes and our expectations as we welcome a new superintendent into DPS. Here's our call to action. To school boards, we know that finding a leader is never an easy task, yet finding a leader that is driven to dismantle systematic racism and its connectedness to oppression is a rigorous one. We ask that Denver Public Schools Board of Education recognize that in order to be a district that is about anti-racism and dismantling racism, that we are action-based and not symbolic. A part of that action is to hire a superintendent that is committed to supporting our resolution. This is the beginning of 2021, and I can't believe we are still talking about racial equality within education. This work needs to be the centerpiece in what our district is about. And if it is, then the incoming superintendent must lead this work and not be intimidated by it. If principals are going to be charged to lead this work, then they have to know that the superintendent and the school board has their back. In addition to being full-time students and being committed to the work we do, we have proven that we deserve to be a part of the superintendent search. It is essential to the future of DPS students that look like me that we can help with the selection process of the new superintendent. If you enjoyed today's take, make sure to into our next episode, Culturally Responsive Future, airing on Thursday, February 4th, featuring Theo Shaw, the Executive Director of Culturally Sustained Curriculum and Instruction, Jamie Villarobaset, the Director of Culturally Responsive Education, and Joy Torres, the Curriculum Specialist of Culturally Responsive Education. We will be discussing the restructuring of the CRE department, their goals, focus, and how our collaboration is helping move the No Justice, No Peace resolution forward. You can follow us on our Facebook page, No Justice, No Peace, DMOK is the Take, and email us at dmokthetake at gmail.com. 
Make sure you give us your feedback through our social media and contact us for a chance to be on the show and give us your take. No justice, no peace, no justice.